Hi everyone, Perry Coleman here. I run a small consulting company called Delta Environmental Consulting. I've spent the last four decades or so messing about with salt field, salt marsh and salt lake ecology and botany. Today I'm going to be talking to you about tidal salt marshes located between the land and the sea. Many of you have heard me speak before on how salt marshes drive the productivity of our marine areas. Despite this, salt marshes are becoming hugely degraded and today I'm going to be talking about the restoration of salt marshes. This is what happens to our salt marshes. The bottom three items, ORV use, rubbish dumping, grazing and trampling, are important, but they're relatively easily remediated. The top two issues are the big problems and are the most difficult to remediate. They impact huge areas and have profound, and in the case of landfilling, sometimes irreversible consequences. As very few people are about to hand back expensively filled land to be returned to salt marsh, I will ignore that here and concentrate on the restoration of existing and stranded salt marshes. With salt marshes, geomorphology rules. It's all about the shape of the landform. In the diagram, you can see the obvious changes in vegetation as you go up the slope. Where the plants are depends to their relationship with how frequently the tide arrives. Basically, mangroves grow above the low tide mark. Low marsh, dominated by the cyclocornea glassworts, grows below the mean high tide mark. And mid marsh, dominated by mixed tectocornea samphires, grows up to around the mean higher high water mark. High marsh, where blue bushes, salt bushes, grasses and forbs can be found, grows where it rarely gets wet by the tide and where there may be some regular land-based runoff or brackish estuarine inputs. In South Australia, we have another supertidal marsh habitat called Sabkas. These are semi-closed basins, often wind-scoured to a level lower than the surrounding high marsh, subject to occasional storm-driven inundation from the sea, with very little freshwater input and high evaporation. Only a couple of species of samphire, including the vulnerable fan samphire, can tolerate living in such an inhospitable habitat. The diagram shows little magic test strips above each habitat, marked with the average soil conditions. I wish such handy dipsticks actually existed. What they show us is not wholly unexpected. Basically, the marshes get drier as you go up the slope until you reach those funny sabkas. Being depressions and containing underlying fragipans, which are hard layers of gypsum crystallised under the surface, the sabkas are as wet as the mid-marsh. The salinity is indicated by how much chloride is present. It is high in the low marsh where the tide comes so often and where the sun dries up the tidal water left as the tide ebbs each day. In fact, it's actually saltier than it is in the mangroves. As you head upslope, salt levels fall because it's about a balance between the amount of tidal water that comes in and the rainfall that leaches the salt out. Once again, the closed basins of the Sabkas do not allow any salt water that arrives in the pans to be removed. Evaporation is greater than rainfall in most of the areas where Sabkas occur, and so all of the salt water that arrives in the pans just stays there. They're the saltiest of all the near coastal habitats. pH in the low marsh, with good tidal circulation, generally matches that of seawater. This is not always the case in degraded marshes, and we will look at that later. The mid-marsh, where tidal exchange is less frequent, but where the substrate straight stays very wet, tends to have a lower pH because of the breakdown of sulphates in the moist anaerobic conditions. The high marsh is drier and has less sulphates from seawater, just as it has less chlorides, and so the pH is higher. The sabkas are moist and sulphates are high and so the pH is lower again. 
Finally, the strips show us something about the soil types. The regular water movement in the low marsh can remove fine materials, and so many low marshes, not all, can be quite sandy or sandy loams. The less frequent inundation in the mid marsh allows more loamy soils to accumulate, and the high, in the high marsh there is likely to be fine clay rich loams. The sabkas, on the other hand, are basically mineral clays. Small areas of coarser material accumulate on the surface as tiny wind driven ridges, but the flat basins are just simply clay. This slide is just a quick look here at the changes in vegetation through the salt marshes. The range of species clearly increases as you go up slope. For those interested in examining this picture in more detail, you can find it in Chapter 7, Salt Marshes, in the Natural History of Gulf St Vincent, published by the Royal Society of South Australia. So, enough with the cute hand waving. How often do these vegetation associations like to get wet? That of course varies. In cold places with high rainfalls, or really hot places with very low rainfalls, you can find the same associations growing in somewhat different places compared to the inundation pattern of the daily tides. But we are lucky that Doug Fotheringham surveyed South Australian salt marsh vegetation associations and determined their preferences back in the early 1990s. This gives us a really good handle on the amount of inundation that our local species need. In other areas where such useful data is not available, you would have to survey transects through your marshes, check your tidal inundation to see if there is any lag or attenuation, and compare it to the nearest tidal station, and then work out the inundation frequency from the corrected tidal station data. Tidal data. Well, tides are remarkably variable. There are places with one or two high tides a day. Where there are two, they may be similar sizes, or there may be a big tide and a smaller tide. The bigger of the two tides can even shift from being in the morning to being in the evening at different times of the year. Then there are the monthly tidal cycles of spring tides and neap tides. There can be dodge tides where a neap tide is essentially holds the same level all day. And we must not forget that the atmospheric conditions of high and low pressure can alter the size of the tides, as can wind effects. The outer harbour tide uh, chart that is shown here because it was one I had to hand shows about six weeks worth of tides in the winter of 2009. You can see the different amplitudes of the neap and spring tides. You can see the wider gap of a dodge tide and the roughness and unusual height resulting from the storm effects in what should have been a neap period. Site specific issues such as lag time, attenuation and amplification need to be assessed for your site. Are there narrowings that amplify the tide as occurs at the top of the gulfs or in some estuaries? Are there extensive salt marsh flats for the tide to cross or tidal restrictions like roadways and embankments that flatten or attenuate the tides or that make the top of the tide later than at the tidal station? Bars in creeks or offshore can result in tidal water being held in the marsh at low tide. To find out how the tide in your salt marsh compares to the tide at the local tidal station, you can use sophisticated water level sensors such as automatic tidal gauges, or you can use simple tide staffs with manual observations. The, formula, the, the former gives you very good understanding of your site with very little labour entailed, but the latter will do just as well if you do not have the capital and you do have plenty of dedicated observers. As an example, the effects of offshore bars can be seen in the lowest diagram on the slide, in the pink trace, which is Salt Creek. The bottom of the tide is truncated compared to the open water tide at Outer Harbour. This is typical of creeks that drain into Gulf St Vincent because there are offshore seagrass beds at the mouth of the creeks before the open water. 
the seagrass beds are exposed at low tide and hold the water back in the creeks. Where there are tidal restrictions like roads crossing salt marshes, the tide may never enter the salt marsh, or it may only have small pipes to flow through, and the tidal trace in such situations could be truncated at both the high and the low tide. Tidal stations located all over Australia carefully tabulate all the very variable data they record and release it as really simple tables called exceedance tables, which record how many hours the tide was above the various heights on the tidal staff since the day that tide station was opened. You need to contact the National Tidal Centre to obtain exceedance tables for the nearest station to the salt marsh you're interested in. These tables can be used to develop exceedance graphs. Such a graph can be used to determine flooding frequency of different elevations in the salt marsh, either as a percentage of time or as a return interval. Return interval charts are particularly useful for looking at changes in flooding frequency that may result from different amounts of sea level rise. For an example, on the Outer Harbour ARRI chart, the top diagram on the slide, you can see how the current annual king tide becomes a monthly affair with 30 centimetres of sea level rise. Fortnightly, with 50 centimetres of sea level rise, and would occur every couple of days with a 70 centimetre uh, increase in sea level. But it's not just about tides. Salt marsh soils are rich in calcium sulphate, gypsum, the second most common salt in seawater after sodium chloride. The stranding of salt marshes behind embankments or roads allows the development of acid from this sulphate. I'll look at how that happens in the next slide, but the point of this slide is that the stranding causes the land level to subside, a combination of compaction on drying and the eating up of all the carbonate deposits by the produced acid. As an aside, the breakdown of carbonates by acid sulphate soils creates significant greenhouse emissions as well. Subsidence here in South Australia tends to be somewhat less than a metre in our stranded marshes. In the US, stranded marshes can be up to five metres lower than the adjacent natural marshes. Basically, we stranded our marshes more recently than they did with most of our marshes being stranded between 1890 and 1970, compared to many in the US where stranded started in the mid-1600s. Acid production isn't just a chemical process, it's a bacterially mediated process. That is, the processes that change stable gypsum in seawater into sulfuric acid are set in motion by bacteria even though some steps, such as the ionic um, hydrogen sulphide reacting with oxygen to make acid, can occur in a purely physical reaction if the conditions are right. So hold on to your hats while I take you on an Alice in Wonderland excursion down the microscope to see what is happening in the soils of a salt marsh. Sulphate reduction occurs where organisms like desulfur vibrio that live in anaerobic muddy sediments get their oxygen by stripping it out of the sulphate part of gypsum, producing hydrogen sulphide gas and hydrogen sulphide ions dissolved in the water. If this water mixes with fresh seawater that carries oxygen, the sulphide, the sulphide ions may acidify. But the carbonates that are also in the seawater tend to neutralise the acid. Where access to fresh seawater is restricted, or where these areas dry out and oxygen penetrates, both of which occur in stranded marshes, acid can build up. Where the surface waters in a salt marsh lie stagnant and the oxygen is all used up, you may get coloured sulphur bacteria that like the sunlight but don't like oxygen. They use the sulphur they obtain from the dissolved hydrogen sulphide gas made by desulfur vibrio 
the sulfur is stored in these coloured bacteria as feroxidin globules in the green or purple bacteria's body and is responsible for their colour. Most of the ionic sulphide made by desulfur vibrio attaches to metal ions in the water. All the elements of the world are dissolved in seawater and it becomes part of the sediments. While salt marsh soils are exposed to air for part of the day, they mostly stay wet. When marshes are stranded, they become dry for very long periods, allowing oxygen to penetrate deeply. As well as direct acidification from the presence of oxygen, more bacteria come into play in this situation. The oxygen-loving Begiatoa oxidizes hydrogen sulfide gas and ions by stripping off the hydrogen that it needs to help it use the nitrogen in rotting seaweed for food. It stores the sulphur, which it does not need, in its body in bright white reflective globules. Another oxidizing bacteria is thiobacillus, which can use some of those sedimented metal sulphides or even the elemental sulphur globules that are sedimented out after Begiatoa dies. It adds oxygen to that sulphur in the presence of water during the process of stripping the nitrogen it needs out of the rotting organics, and it makes sulfuric acid. So as you can see, this is a rather complicated system. Well, there's probably enough of the nasty chemistry. What does this mean for us in restoring subsided stranded march marshes? Neil Saintelin has published many papers on mangrove transgression as a result of global sea level rise, but transgression is also affected by local geomorphological effects as well. Subsidence resulting from stranding exacerbates mangrove transgression considerably. South Australian studies in subsided marshes conducted by Burton and then later by Fotheringham and then again even later by Coleman show that mangroves have transgressed as a front across local reflooded subsided salt marshes at speeds of anywhere up to 18 metres a year. Thankfully, this has slowed somewhat as the acid sulphate soils have been mediated by seawater and as the mangroves are reaching the landward areas where acid was not produced. This rate of advance is an order of magnitude faster than the advance across marshes that have never been stranded, such as those on Torrens Island, where the advance is mainly driven by sea level rise and a reduction in sediment supply. If the aim of restoring a salt marsh is not to grow a mangrove forest, this challenge will need to be met in any restoration project. Subsided salt marshes when reopened to the sea, also show other changes in their soils. Our studies show that low marsh soils in subsided marshes where the base soil elevation is now below mean low water that have been reopened to the sea have significantly different soils to low marshes in sites that have never been stranded. This difference is detectable more than 70 years after reflooding the sites. The most obvious difference is the soil texture. Subsided sites have peaty organic rich sediments. This is probably a result of two features. Firstly, the basic physical fact that stuff accumulates in dips and hollows. And secondly, the fact that the clonal salt marsh species attempt to grow where they are in place, growing fresh branches on top of themselves to keep pace with the increased tidal inundation. The peat underneath today's salt marshes is actually the remains of the same individual plants that are growing on the surface today. The moisture content of that fibrous organic soil is extremely high compared to normal low marsh. Because that extra moisture is all seawater, the salinity of the soil is very high, and seawater's high sulphate con content combined with the sodden soils mean that sulphate reduction will drive a lowering of the pH, 
the pH in subsided marshes that have been reflooded is lower than any of the other marsh zones. The good news is that despite the clearly different soil structure and chemistry, the main low marsh plant species, Sarcocornia quinquiflora and Suede australis, tolerate the conditions and so the low marsh area of a reflooded subsided marsh looks very similar to that of an unsubsided marsh. Whether the soil conditions have an impact on invertebrate life that lives in the substrate is an open question, however, and whether any potential difference in in-fauna has potential to impact on shorebird feeding or juvenile fishes feeding uh, in the use of the marsh at spring tides is also unknown. Controlled reflooding is an option that ensures that there is not too great an increase in wetting of salt marsh areas in a reflooded marsh, and it reduces mangrove incursion, it slows the accumulation of peaty and organic soils, and it allows seawater carbonates to gradually address acid sulphate soils while reducing the displacement of mono monosulfidic black oozes that could be present in a stranded marsh. But there is a narrowing of the suitable elevation range for intertidal habitats. Subtidal and lower intertidal habitats migrate uphill, while supertidal highland habitats can penetrate further downhill. There is an ongoing cost in maintenance of seawalls and control structures. The site would require regular monitoring so that the impacts of sea level rise, about 10 centimetres around much of South Australia since 1990, can be addressed incrementally by reducing daily water exchange if necessary. This imperfect solution may, however, be the only choice where there is a very constrained site with no option for retreat. Controlled reflooding can use large culverts for sites that are very large, only marginally subsided and where there are concerns around flooding adjacent upland areas. The use of smaller pipes set at differing elevations can be used in smaller area constricted sites and can minimise the marked truncation seen in the high spring tides, extending the range of habitats suitable for mid and upper salt marsh species in these very limited sites. Alternatives like underflow weirs have been used in some created salt marsh sites in urban settings in Australia. Um, they're quite useful um, in keeping out floating trash, but they can also keep out reproductive material, which is counterproductive if you are hoping for natural recolonisation of your salt marsh species. Such structures should probably be limited to planted sites only, where urban litter is a proven problem. Including upland retreat areas is an alternative approach that accepts that subsided areas may be lost to mangroves or open water in extremely deeply subsided areas, such as in many parts of the USA, and in all sites over time in response to sea level rise. By incorporating an upland buffer, you allow landward migration and accept that there will be an evolving mosaic of different plants over time as associations migrate across the site. You need to ensure that your rehabilitated sites have an appropriate elevation change and an upland area so that migration can occur. The approach accepts that sea level rise is going to contribute to the already impacted site and that the site will be in flux. Such sites can be largely left to be self-managed with low ongoing maintenance and low operational costs. One aspect to be aware of is that the increased inundation rapidly addresses any acid sulphate soils present, but in some sites where deep holes contain monosulfidic black oozes, there is some risk that this may be mobilised, causing temporary impacts. And CSIRO are currently working on trying to get some kind of a handle on this.
improved sediment supply is always necessary in subsided salt marshes. Marine carbonates and sediments from turbid seawater are the first sediment source that springs to mind in salt marshes, and reflooding stranded marshes addresses that need. But salt marshes have two sides, uphill as well as downhill, and they receive sediment from both. Reconnecting creeks and storm water flows into salt marshes that are being restored can increase the amount of sediment availability significantly so that the marsh plain can accrete and keep pace with sea level rise. There are a number of ways to do this, but the simplest involve reopening bunds and embankments that have closed off creeks from the salt marshes they once fed. The photograph on the slide shows the wasted sediments of the upstream Mississippi causing seagrass deterioration in the Gulf of Mexico where they end up, at the same time as the adjacent salt marshes are eroding due to sediment starvation. While our rainfall is less, during the few times that our rivers do flow, they carry a large amount of sediment. The Adelaide Coastal Water Study estimated that suspended sediment loads to Gulf St Vincent from Adelaide's creeks and rivers is well over 10,000 tonnes per annum all of which is settling on seagrass and smothering it instead of feeding salt marshes and hind marshes, as would have occurred before urbanisation. There isn't much data for Port Lincoln, but the same principles apply. Our focus on getting stormwater away as fast as possible in, into one or two large discharges may well need a serious rethink. In subsided sites, the marsh may have an extremely large appetite for sediments. Meeting this need can be a challenge. Wastewater plant discharge water, which is rich in phytoplankton, can assist the accumulation of sediment in salt marshes in two ways. The direct sedimentation of phytoplankton is one, but also the fresh nature of the discharge allows rapid growth of salt marsh plants, which eventually decompose into the sediment. This is currently being trialled in Californian rehabilitation projects of the South Bay salt ponds. Hydraulic placement of dredged fill into very low lying areas such as borrow pits or deeply subsided marshes can play a part, but this is only possible where salt marshes are being restored close to deep water areas that a dredge barge can operate in. For example, the subsided and stranded Gilman marshes are close to the deep water of North Arm and would only need a short delivery pipe to receive hydraulic fill. But in the northern gulfs, offshore seagrass beds with an elevation of about 0.1 metre AHD extend quite a long way, so there is little opportunity for large vessels to get close enough to provide such fill. Studies overseas and observations here in South Australia and in New South Wales have shown that planting out a salt marsh is more suitable for very small sites, or sites where the topography has been subject to extensive reworking with earth moving machinery. For larger sites, or sites with a natural but somewhat subsided topography, normal natural colonisation can provide a dense cover in a remarkably short period of time, if there is a local salt marsh in close proximity. Here in South Australia, where gas pipelines have been placed across existing salt marsh sites, considerable attention has been paid to ensuring that the finished surface of the soil matches the surrounding salt marsh elevation. No topsoils that could harbour weeds were brought onto the sites and any excess soil was removed. In these cases, strips of land hundreds of metres long and up to 20 metres wide have naturally revegetated to similar density and species composition as a surrounding salt marsh within a couple of winters. Created salt marshes in some parts of New South Wales have been less fortunate, as salt marsh habitats there have been gravely reduced in area. Even with tube stock plantings, some of these sites are looking sparse a decade after being planted. If you're dealing with a subsided site, it will be important to consider seed and colonising materials access to the site. Hydrological barriers like underflow weirs or the position of remnant embankments that act as groins can hinder the penetration of useful reproductive materials onto your site.
Hydrological aspects can affect colonisation even in unsubsided sites. Offshore gyres and littoral drift carry reproductive material along in specific directions. And you need to understand these features in relation to your site. Ideally, you wish to sweep colonising materials into your site. If material is bypassing your site or held offshore, you may need to reconsider your design. The good news is that we're not inventing the wheel here. People in other jurisdictions are struggling with the same problems that we face in South Australia. Many subsided marshes in the US have surface elevations that are several metres below sea level and restoration requires dredged fill and other expensive methods to get the topography anywhere near where it needs to be before salt marsh can start to establish. Many of the issues in both temperate grass-based salt marshes and in South Australia's Mediterranean climate kenopod dominated salt marshes are similar. Subsidence, acid sulphate soils, sea level rise, and restricted sediment supply. At a recent Restore America's Estuary Conference, there were papers presented on salt marsh restoration techniques from the Arctic Circle to the tropics. The ideas were many and varied, expensive to economical. Management was intensive to laissez-faire. At least some of the ideas and methods presented should be able to give us some ideas and cautions for our degraded salt marshes here. And it's really not that hard. The information is out there in the degraded marshes themselves and in the neighbouring intact marshes and in historically self-regenerating sites. The photo on this slide is an accidental salt marsh restoration that occurred in the 1930s when a seawall breached and the site was surrendered back to the sea. The most important pieces of equipment needed to study these marshes are your eyes and a questioning mind. In summary, elevations and flooding regime are everything in a salt marsh restoration project. And you're not just fixing things for today. There is sea level rise to think about too. So the marsh will need ongoing capacity to elevate its marsh plain through sediment accumulation, a source of nearby colonisation material, and somewhere to migrate. Time frames for evolution to mature marshes may be very long and must be viewed in the context of the wider evolution of adjacent tidal wetlands as they respond to natural and human-induced changes. While the published work all, recommend, all recommends really careful planning and the following of rigorous design methodologies, there is a growing acceptance of the fact that not everything is known. Outcomes may be unpredictable and ongoing monitoring is required to identify areas where evolution towards a satisfactory habitat is stalled and where further intervention is necessary. This monitoring should be coupled with ongoing research projects over several decades, especially if it is hoped that the lessons learnt can be transferred to future rehabilitation sites. So thank you all for listening to me today. We've covered quite a lot of ground in this presentation as we discussed what we've learnt about salt marsh restoration so far. And I wouldn't be surprised if you have questions or if you'd like some more information on some of these aspects that I touched on. Contact me with any questions using the socials listed on this slide and I'll do my best to answer.